Amen. The first question tonight is as follows. Given the distinctive content of Paul's epistle to the Romans, can you explain why Paul called for the chief of the Jews upon his arrival in Rome? Also, why are the recipients of the epistle of Romans not mentioned in Acts 28? So, good question. Let's start by just understanding some things about the book of Romans. So, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 7. Romans 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So what we see in verse 7 is that Romans was written to the saints in Rome. That shouldn't be surprising. But notice something in verse 13. Verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, in other words, he was hindered, he was prevented, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So when Paul says that he might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles, it obviously means that the people he's writing to, the Romans, are Gentiles, because he talks about other Gentiles. So we understand that Romans is written to the saints in Rome, and we understand that they're predominantly Gentiles. We also understand that Romans was written in Acts chapter 20, verse 3. That's the time when Paul wrote it. So now look with me at Acts 28. Acts chapter 28. And notice verse 16. And when we came to Rome, this is when Paul first arrives in Rome at the end of the book of Acts. The centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Verse 17, And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. So that's interesting. In Acts 20, verse 3, Paul writes to the Romans, and it's very clear that the Romans are, the Roman saints are predominantly Jews, because Romans 1.13 tells you that. What happens in Acts 28, though, is the first thing that Paul does when he arrives in Rome is he doesn't call for the saints to come see him. What he calls for is he calls for the chief of the Jews to come see him. That's why the listener asked the question. So why is that? Why did he do that? To understand why that is, let's back up for a minute and look with me at Matthew chapter 10. We need to get a little bit of background. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the twelve are sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, when we look during the Lord's earthly ministry and we see the twelve being sent out, they are sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the Lord specifically says, do not go to the Gentiles. Contrast that with Romans 11. So get Romans chapter 11, Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So Paul is described as the apostle of the Gentiles. But just so we're clear, that title does not mean that Paul never spoke to anyone else. Paul is given the title the Apostle of the Gentiles for the following reason. Peter was specifically told, along with the rest of the twelve, do not go to the Gentiles. So he was not supposed to go to the Gentiles at all. Paul was called the Apostle of the Gentiles because he was specifically 
sent to the Gentiles, but do not conclude from that that Paul never spoke to Jews, because he clearly did. So look with me, if you would, at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Notice, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. When Paul describes the gospel of Christ that he preached, he specifically says that he went to the Jew. In fact, he says, to the Jew first. So let's make sure we understand this. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He was sent to Gentiles, but don't be confused. Paul did not preach only to Gentiles. He clearly preached to Jews also. Let me show you um, something then, if you would. Get, get with me Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. What we need to understand before we go further is this. When Paul says to the Jew first, what exactly does he mean? Does he mean, for example, that the Jews had a superior position in the body of Christ? Let's consider that. Romans chapter 10, 12, verse 12. Romans 10, 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Get with me Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In the new man, in the body of Christ, is there a difference between Jew and Greek? There's not. Look with me then at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So what we saw there in Romans 10, what we saw in Colossians 3, what we saw in Galatians 3, is that in the body of Christ, there's no difference between Jew and Greek. The Jew does not have an advantage. The Jew does not have a superior position. But then what does Romans 1.16 mean? Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first. Well, what does it mean to the Jew first if Jew and Gentile are the same in the body of Christ? Get with me Acts 17. I think that Acts 17 will help explain this to us. Acts chapter 17. Let's start in verse 1. In Acts 17, we're going to look at the time when Paul was in Thessalonica. Acts 17, 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. So when Paul travels to Thessalonica, Scripture notes that there was a synagogue there. Notice verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. When Paul went into the synagogue in Thessalonica, was that out of character? Was that unusual? Was that rare? Or was that Paul's customary practice? Well, obviously, it was his customary practice because verse 2 says, as his manner was. When Paul would go to a new city, what's the first thing he would do? He would go to the synagogue. Verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Christ. 
When Paul would go into the synagogues when he first arrived in a city, what he would do is he would preach to them Jesus Christ because they needed to understand who Jesus Christ was. They needed to understand that the Son of God who had been prophesied in the Old Testament had indeed come and had died for their sins. So that's why Paul went into the synagogues first. Now what I'll suggest to you is this. There is a reason that Paul had to go to the Jew first, and it's simply this. For the previous 2,000 years, there was a difference between Jew and Greek. Israel was God's chosen people. Israel was given the covenants of promise. Now, we know that in the book of Acts, Israel will fall and diminish. And as a result of Israel's fall and diminishing, they will be the same as Gentiles. There will be no difference. But Paul needed to go to the synagogues. He needed to go to the Jews first to tell them about Christ and to tell them about the change in circumstances. So let me give you an earthly example, if I could. What happens in the business world when someone's position changes? In other words, let's, maybe their position is being eliminated. Hopefully not but sometimes that happens. Sometimes the responsibilities of their position are changing. Well, when that happens, should management talk to all of that person's coworkers first and say, hey, have you heard about what's happening to him? Or should management talk first to the individual who's impacted? Well, obviously the right thing to do is you have a direct conversation first with the people who are impacted. Well, did the dispensation of grace impact Israel? Yes, it did, because they fell, they diminished from the prior position of blessing that they had. So Paul, to effectuate God's will, God had to tell Israel, there's been a change. Your position in time past has changed. And while Paul did that, he also told them the solution, which was, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. So you can see there's a reason that Paul went to the Jew first. Notice with me Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. In Acts 17, we were in Thessalonica. In Acts 18, we're in Corinth. Acts 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Go to verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. So in Corinth, Paul behaves very similar to what he did in Thessalonica. He goes into the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews on multiple Sabbath days. Verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. He's telling them that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God that had long been prophesied. Notice verse 6, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed. In other words, Paul tells them, Jesus was the Son of God. He's the Messiah that was promised. What they should have done is they should have said, Hallelujah. God's promise has been fulfilled. We will now believe on Jesus Christ. But verse 6 says they didn't do that. What they did is they opposed themselves. When you reject the truth, do you hurt the person that you're hearing it from? You don't hurt the person you're hearing it from. You hurt yourself because it's a harm to your own soul. Now notice what happens. And when they had opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So Paul had fulfilled his responsibility. He went to the Jew first. He told them that Jesus was the Christ. When they rejected it, when they opposed themselves, he said, I'm clean. Your blood be upon your own head. It's not my responsibility, and I'm going to go to the Gentiles. He went to the Jew first. When the Jews rejected it, he then went to the Gentiles. Get with me, Acts 13. Acts chapter 
13. In Acts 13, we're going to be in Antioch in Pisidia. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. You can see this pattern is very clear in the book of Acts. When Paul goes into a city, he goes to the synagogue first. Verse 15, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. In other words, it was an opportunity for people that had a word of exhortation to stand up and share it. Notice verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. So Paul takes advantage of this opportunity to tell Israel about the Christ. Skip down to verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Paul had first spoken to the Jews, then the Gentiles wanted to hear it. And you'll notice that's what Paul's going to do. Verse 43, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Verse 45, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Notice what Paul says in verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Let's just pause there. It was necessary that it first be spoken to them because they were God's chosen people. And God couldn't just ghost on them. He couldn't just say, I'm not talking to you. I'm not telling you what's going on. That's inconsistent with how God does things. God wanted Paul to speak to Israel first. It was necessary that Paul do that. Now notice what happens. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Now, by the way, that's what happens when someone rejects the gospel. When you reject the gospel, you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Please do not make that mistake. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So now go with me to Acts 28. What we've seen again and again and again is Paul went to the Jew first because that's what he needed to do based upon the historical precedent. We saw that that was his manner. So now let's try to understand Acts 28, verse 16. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So in Acts 28, what we fully expect is we expect Paul to go into a synagogue because that's what Acts 17 and Acts 13 and Acts 18 would suggest. But he doesn't do that. Why doesn't he do that? Well, for the simple reason, he's a prisoner. He's stuck in his own house. So since Paul can't go to the synagogue, what does he do? Verse 17, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Since Paul can't go to the synagogue, he will have the Jews come to him. So he summons them to come see him at the house that he's staying at. Verse 20. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Obviously, Paul's hope is that they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. They came to his lodging because Paul was obviously bound to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, just as he did in the prior passages we looked at. Look at verse 24. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. If there's ever a verse about ministry, that's the verse. You know what happens when you preach the gospel? You know what happens when you teach the word of God? Some believe, and some don't. And that's just how it is. People get to choose. Verse 25, 
And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. Verse 26, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So Paul went to the Jew first in Rome, and how did the majority of the Jews respond? Their heart was waxed gross. They rejected it. They wouldn't receive his preaching. So notice Acts 28, 28. And the Acts 28, 28, I would suggest to you, is the conclusion, it's the fitting conclusion of the book of Acts. It is the pronouncement that Paul's ministry to Israel that was necessary based upon historical precedent has been fulfilled. Verse 28. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Paul fulfilled his responsibility to the Jews. Now he's going to Gentiles. Notice verse 29. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. Notice this and received all that came in unto him. So Paul is in his own hired house for two years, and he's able to receive people. You can decide for yourself, but my belief is Romans chapter 1, when Paul wrote to the saints at Rome, Romans 1.13, they were Gentiles. What I think happened is when Paul's in his own hired house for two years, and so he can't go to meet with the saints, I think the saints come to meet with him. And so he teaches them out of his own house. Verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So hopefully that gives you some clarity on how to think about uh, the writing of the book of Romans and who it's addressed to and how to reconcile that with what Paul does in Acts chapter 28 when he is in Rome. So now we're going to go to the next question. And here's what the next question is. When the KJV uses italics, doesn't that mean that the King James translators were improperly adding words that shouldn't have been included. Let me say that again. The King James Bible has italics, and those italics indicate words that were added by the translators. Isn't that clear evidence that the King James translators were doing something they shouldn't do? Doesn't that show that they were adding to the Word of God? Well, if you've been watching this program for any period of time, you know that I'm not going to say that the King James Bible has errors because it simply doesn't. Here's what's going on, and it's, it really is rather a simple explanation. The King James translators were scrupulously honest. When there was a word in the, in the text that they produced, the King James text, that was not based on an underlying Greek or Hebrew word, they put it in italics. In other words, when they were looking at the Greek text or the Hebrew text, and then they were translating it into English, if they ever added a word that wasn't in the original manuscripts that they had, the copies that they had, they would put the word in italics. Now you may say, well, well doesn't that sound like they're adding to the Word of God? The reality is this, when you translate from one language to another language, you sometimes have to add words that were not in the original language to give the proper sense in the receptor language. That's what they were doing. They weren't just adding their own opinions. They weren't just adding random words for no reason. They were adding words that were necessary to give the sense of what the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts said. Now, by the way, that's a common practice. That's not, some, that's not simply something that the King James translators did. 
other translators do that as well. So when you see italics in the King James, you shouldn't think to yourself, well, those words probably shouldn't be there. You might wonder to yourself, why don't other translators put the words they supply in italics? Wouldn't that be the more straightforward, transparent way to do things? So there's nothing wrong with the, the, the words in italics in the King James, they're perfectly fine. But I thought I would show you one very fascinating example that uh, it'd just be interesting for you to see. So if we take 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, you'll see the verse as it is written in the King James. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. The part that I've highlighted in yellow, that entire clause is in italics. I put it in yellow because I wasn't sure if you could see it. But if you pick up your King James Bible and you look at 1 John 2, 23, this entire section is in italics. And the reason it was in italics is that phrase, that clause, did not appear in the Greek manuscripts that were available to the King James translators. Now, what you might think to yourself is you might think, well, wait a minute, that's not just supplying a single word so that the verse makes sense. It's supplying this entire thought. How do they do that? Well, here's the explanation. When the King James translators were translating the King James, they had a lot more sources than just simply Greek manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts. They had other sources that were available to them, and they knew that this was part of 1 John 2, verse 23, so it was proper for them to include it. But they were scrupulously honest. So what they did is, since this language did not appear in the Greek manuscripts that they had, they put it in italics. They were being completely straightforward. Now, I want you to notice one more slide. This is the NIV. None of this is in italics, and if you notice, the NIV has a phrase that says essentially the exact same thing as what the King James says. In other words, those words are proper. They were part of the original Greek text. They should be there. So let me sum it up by simply saying this. The italics in the King James are not something for you to worry about. They're not something to be concerned about. It's simply the King James translators revealing their work. They're showing these words were words that we supplied because they were not in the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that we had. It's not, a, it's not suggesting that the words shouldn't be there. It's not suggesting that the words are there in error. Next question. Why does the KJV not capitalize some pronouns that refer to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Is this an error? So let's think about that. Let's think about that together. So you know that I'm not going to say that the King James Bible has errors, but it is the case that there are pronouns that refer to God in the KJV that are not capitalized. So what's, what's the explanation? Let's start with this. My general encouragement to you, you can of course choose to handle this however you want, is that when you read something in the King James that seems to be an error, you should resist that conclusion. It's far more likely, in fact, it is certain, that it's not an error, but there is an error in your thinking. In other words, there's something that we're not understanding if we think that the King James has an error. And so the simple explanation, I'll give you the conclusion up front and then I'll show you this. The simple reason why the King James does not capitalize some pronouns that refer to God is that the King James does not always follow modern rules of grammar. It simply doesn't. Now, you, you may, I, I trust you realize this, 
language changes over time. There are words that become archaic. They're not bad words, they're not wrong words, they're simply words that we stop using and so the words become archaic. The language has changed. Capitalization rules change over time. Punctuation rules change. Grammar and style rules change over time. It's just simply a fact that what happens with language is that language changes over time. What people often do is they look at the King James Bible and they, they see something and they say, well, well, that's not right. It really should read such and such. And what they're doing is they're applying their modern current understanding to the King James when that's not how things were done at that time. Let me give you an example. So, for example, the King James was written, it was first uh, published in 1611. So let's take a more recent document. Let's take the United States Constitution. That was first drafted in 1787. And what I would encourage you to do with the Constitution is read it. I know that no one in Washington, D.C. does, but that doesn't mean that you and I can't. In fact, I'd encourage you to read that. If you read the Constitution, what you're going to notice is there are some words that are spelled differently from how we would spell them today. If you read the Constitution, you're going to notice that capitalization is different from how we would do capitalization today. That doesn't mean that the Constitution has errors. It doesn't mean that those differences are somehow defects. What it means is that language has changed over time. So when people look at the King James and they say, well, the pronouns should be different, or this should be different, or that should be different, it's frankly rather presumptuous. So let me give you uh, three different examples of where the King James Version does not follow the modern grammar rules that we would use today. So I'll give you three examples of that. First of all, get Mark. We'll start in the book of Mark. Get Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. Now, the, the way that verse reads, it really sounds like instead of saying his disciples follow him, it should say his disciples followed him. Let's read it again. And he went out, that's past tense, and he went out from thence and came past tense, into his own country, and his disciples, present tense, follow him. Now, if you wrote that sentence in an English paper and you turned it into your high school English teacher today, what would the English teacher say? The English teacher would say, well, Dave, you have a problem. The first part of the sentence is in past tense, and then the next part of the sentence is in present tense. And what you need to do for good writing is you need to write in a way where the verb tense is consistent. And they would mark it wrong and they would tell you that you need to revise it. That is the current style. But God is not bound by man's rules as to style. Obviously, God was aware that that read follow rather than followed. If he wanted it to be different, he could have made it to be different. But don't tell me that that is an error. It's just simply not following modern usage. I'll give you another example. So the first example we saw was that the Bible does not always employ consistency in verb tense. It will use different verb tenses even within the same verse, the same sentence. The second example is this. The Bible does not always follow the rule that a pronoun must refer to its closest antecedent. I'll say that again. The Bible does not always follow the rule that a pronoun must refer to its closest antecedent. So when you're normally, when, when you're writing today and you're using a pronoun, when you look at that pronoun, 
that pronoun should match the noun of the same number and person that is closest to it. Look with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 38. Now I want you to notice the pronouns in this verse. If they, and that's a reference to Israel in the context, if they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity. In other words, Israel is in the land of captivity. And what 2 Chronicles is saying is if they return to God with all their heart. But then notice the next part of the verse. And let me just read it all together. If they, that's Israel, return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whither they have carried them captives. The they have carried them. The they is the Gentile nation. The them is Israel. They have carried them captives. So the they at the beginning of the verse is about Israel, but the next they changes from Israel to Israel's enemies with no indication. It just makes the change. Now, if you read the verse, you can tell that's clearly what's being intended. You can tell that's the clear meaning, but that does not follow the modern grammar rule that a pronoun should be based upon its closest antecedent. Why is that? Well, it's not that the Bible has errors. It's that the Bible isn't necessarily bound by how we choose to do things today. I'll give you another example. The Bible often changes from second person to third person without notice. So get with me 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 23. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people? Thy people is a, is a reference to God. The thy is God. It's God's people. And what nation in the earth is like thy people? even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself and to make him a name and to do for you, that's Israel, great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. So thy refers to God in the second person. But you see where it says to do for you great things and terrible? It then refers to Israel in the second person. So the verse starts off talking about God in the second person, but then it changes to you in the second person, referring to Israel. I'll show you another example. Get 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The simple fact of the matter is there are some practices, there are some conventions that the King James Bible follows, or more specifically, there are some human conventions that the King James Bible does not follow, and that doesn't mean that it's in error. That's just a presumptuous, judgmental thing to say. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 9, 19. But if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, the thee there is Israel. But if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given unto them. In verse 19, God refers to Israel in second person as you. But in verse 20, he refers to Israel in third person as them. There's not consistency in the way pronouns are used. Again, this doesn't make the King James Bible wrong. It just simply doesn't follow the modern rules that people think should be followed. So when the King James Bible doesn't capitalize certain pronouns that refer to God, was God aware of that? 
He knew that. It didn't bother him. He's not upset about it. We don't need to be upset about it either. The King James Bible simply doesn't follow some of the modern rules that people believe should be followed. Now, this is a good time to uh, give you some bonus content. So this is another issue that is sort of similar to this topic, and I thought I would mention it. I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but some people will criticize the King James Bible because it doesn't say anything about dinosaurs. And what they'll essentially say is this, look, we have fossils. We have all this evidence that dinosaurs existed and these creatures are huge and the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Obviously, the Bible was a bunch of myths. It wasn't written by people that had actual knowledge of the events that went on at the time because there would be more about dinosaurs. Now, I've come up with an appropriate response to that. Balderdash. That's just nonsense. And so let me just share one thing with you that's fascinating. You do know that the word dinosaur was invented in 1841. So when people say, well, the King James Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs, <sighs> children. If the word wasn't invented until 1841, then it's hardly going to be mentioned within the 1611. So that's point one. Point number two is this. Are you sure that the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs? Have you read Job chapter 40? It talks about a behemoth. I'm going to suggest to you the Bible does say something about dinosaurs. It just simply doesn't use that word because the word hadn't even been invented. One last point before we move to the next question, and that is this. When you encounter people that tell you the King James Bible has errors, they're not telling you about the King James Bible. They're telling you about their heart. You follow me? In other words, when people accuse the Bible of error, they think they're commenting on the Bible. No, they're not commenting on the Bible. They're revealing the inward state of their heart is what they're doing. Next question. Is the first and greatest commandment that the Lord teaches in Matthew 22, verse 37, applicable during the dispensation of grace? So is the first and greatest commandment that's in Matthew 22, 37, does that apply during the dispensation of grace? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 22 and take a look. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 and we'll look at verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. That commandment that's mentioned in Matthew 22, you cannot find anywhere in anything that Paul wrote. And so, the question, does that commandment continue to apply today or does it not? So what this question really tees up, and I'm, I'm thankful to have the question, is it tees up the following issue. What do we do with the portions of Scripture, like the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they say things that are different from Paul? How do we think about that? Some would take the view, well, if it's not mentioned in Paul, then it just doesn't apply. So unless Paul says it, it's not applicable. I don't personally think that's the way to think about it. I think what happens is that if there is something mentioned in the previous scriptures, it applies today unless Paul tells us it doesn't apply. In other words, some take the view that what happens is, unless Paul mentions it, you can ignore it. So you can basically ignore things in time past. I don't think that's the right rule. I think the right rule is, if it's mentioned in time past, it's still true unless Paul tells us otherwise. So let me give you a couple examples. Get with me 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll show you a couple examples of how this works. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. 
Paul says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4 tells you that all of Leviticus about clean and unclean animals is inapplicable today. You'll sometimes hear people say, well, what we need to do is we need to eat better, and therefore we should avoid pork, and we should avoid unclean animals because it's not healthy. You can decide what to do for yourself, obviously, but I would tell you that 1 Timothy 4.4 says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. That tells you, based upon 1 Timothy 4, that Leviticus 11 is not information for today. The, the, the commands in Leviticus about clean and unclean animals, they've been rendered inapplicable because of what Paul says in 1 Timothy 4. Let me give you another example. Get Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Paul never explicitly tells you to do away with animal sacrifices. But what he does is he tells you that you've already been forgiven of all trespasses. In, in so doing, he's telling you, you don't need to be worried about offering an animal sacrifice. The reason why people offered sacrifices in time past was it was part of the program for them to get forgiveness. But when Paul tells us that today during the dispensation of grace, once you believe the gospel, you're forgiven of all trespasses, well then you don't need to worry about an animal sacrifice. There would be no point to it. So those are just two examples of where there's a verse in Paul that tells you major parts of the Old Testament simply don't apply to you today. So now get with me Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. And we'll look at verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Now, Paul never repeats that commandment. But is there anything Paul writes that would tell you not to do that? Is there anything Paul writes where what he says is, don't love the God, the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Love him with, you know, 85%. That's good enough. Don't love him with all your soul. Half is sufficient. And what I would suggest to you is there's no verse like that. There's, no, there's nowhere in Paul where God's, uh, there's nowhere in Paul's writings where it says it's okay to not love the Lord as much as in time past because we're under grace. It says nothing like that. In fact, look with me while you're in Matthew 22, look with me at verse 39. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In Matthew 22, what the Lord does in response to a question is he says, here's the first and greatest commandment, and then he says, here's the second commandment. Now here's where it gets interesting. Get with me Galatians chapter 5. Some of you are excited. You're thinking this Bible study now may become interesting. You've been waiting for that to happen. Galatians 5 verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So in Galatians 5.14, Paul explicitly quotes the second commandment. So does the second commandment apply today? Absolutely, because Paul quoted it, so you know that it applies. But here's what this illustrates. Paul quoted the second commandment, he didn't quote the first commandment. If you take the approach that the only things for today are what Paul wrote, and if Paul didn't write it, then it doesn't apply, that means the first commandment doesn't apply today because Paul never quoted it. He never wrote anything quite like that. But instead, if you take the position that the things that are said in time past apply unless Paul says otherwise, well, it's very clear that the first commandment applies to us today. Now, if you just think about this, I mean, is, isn't this rather obvious? 
Should you today, as a saved person, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Absolutely. You absolutely should. The fact that Paul didn't repeat those words in one of his epistles doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You obviously should do it. So it seems to me, at least, Matthew 22, verse 37, is a, is a terrific example of the principle that you can't just ignore what's outside of Paul. We need to read that as well. Now, I don't try to apply things that Paul has told me not to apply, but there's many truths in the Old Testament that continue to be true today. To take the obvious example, God's promise not to flood the earth continues today to be true, and I'm happy that it is. We're going to take one more question this evening, and the question is a, is a good one, and I think it's a timely one. The question is this, does God give us strength to face the challenges that come up in life like the present circumstances we're in. In other words, does God equip us to handle the challenges we face? I mean, let's just be honest. As you go through daily life on this earth, do you have difficulties? And the answer is you do. As you go through life, you, you may have financial difficulties. You may have health difficulties. You may have interpersonal difficulties. You know, there can be famine and, and war and plague and just all kinds of things because we are on a sin-cursed earth, so you can face all of those challenges. Does, the, does God give you strength to deal with that, or does he not? Look with me, if you would, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 has a verse that is widely, widely quoted but largely, largely misused. Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And the way that that verse is normally used today is, let's say you're a professional athlete. What you do is you say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Through Christ, I can score more points. I can make more tackles. Our team can win and we can beat this other team. And people grab that verse and they use it for their worldly achievements. I can accomplish all these things that I want to accomplish through Christ because he'll give me the strength to do it. My encouragement to you is that that's not what that verse is really saying at all. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. In other words, just go up two verses. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Just pause there and think about that. Paul learned to be content irrespective of, of whatever state he was in. Think about that. Paul spent a lot of time in prison, and he didn't spend his time in prison because he was committing crimes that he deserved to go there. He was wrongly imprisoned. And Paul, he, was, he received 39 stripes multiple times. And he was stoned. And Paul was betrayed by false brethren. And he was shipwrecked. And as you go through the story of Paul's life, there's some fascinating details in 2 Corinthians 11. But he just encountered problem after problem after problem. And what he said in verse 11 is that he learned in whatsoever state he found himself to be content. In other words, his, his contentment, his joy, his peace wasn't based upon external circumstances because frequently the external circumstances around him were always adverse. He faced opposition all the time. He faced persecution. He dealt with hunger, but he learned to be content in the midst of all of that. Look at verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Paul learned to be content even when he didn't have the material blessings he wanted, even when he was so poor that he was abased. He learned how to be abased. He learned how to abound, and it didn't change his joy in Christ. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and 
and to suffer need. He was able to handle both extremes. So then now look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That didn't mean Paul could run faster than anyone he was racing. It didn't mean he could win a boxing match. What it meant was Paul was strengthened by Jesus Christ in his inner man so that as he faced the troubles of life, the challenges of life, he was able to navigate them with contentment in the midst of all these troubles. Does that verse apply to us today? Yes, it does. So as we think about our present circumstances, friends, we, we, we do face adversity, and, and, and who knows what all of it will be. There, there'll be health adversity that many saints face, and there'll be economic adversity that many saints faith, face. And there's just, frankly, troubles around this earth. But Christ strengthens us in our inner man so that we can deal with them. Could I encourage you to do this? When you have doubts, when you have fear, get into God's Word and read what it says about you. Read about who you are in Christ, what, what God the Father has done for you through His Son. And if you keep your attention focused on things above, if you set your affection on things above, the troubles of this life will not bother you as much. This world is not your eternal destiny. This world is not your home. We are meant, brethren, for better things. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'll tell you one of the things we're going to do tomorrow. We had a listener make a request, and uh, I thought this was a good request, so we're going to do it. The request was, uh, could we take one of the sessions and could we cover some basic things about right division uh, some of you may have friends that you want to invite. You You often have folks that you're trying to teach dispensationalism to, right division. What we'll do tomorrow is we will devote that time to teaching some of the principles of right division. So we hope that you'll tune in and we hope that you'll invite friends to tune in. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for a salvation that is eternal and that is free based upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Lord, give us contentment and give us peace in, this, in these troubled times in which we live. Help us to take advantage of this time to witness to those around us that they might believe the gospel. We thank you, God, for all you've done for us, and we give you all the praise and honor. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.